Hi everybody, welcome to Ryan's Room, a show where I find things around my apartment and talk to you about them in a science-y way. In this episode, we've actually got two items. First off is my skunk onesie that I'm wearing right now. So skunks are, I'm sure, an animal that you're familiar with, you've probably seen, probably smelled. Um, but I think they're misunderstood by a lot of people, so I just want to take a little bit about, of this video to just talk a little bit about skunks and what they do. The other item I have is this painting that was actually made by a real-life skunk. So, we're going to talk a little bit about how and why a skunk would have made a painting. So the onesie that I'm wearing is called a Kigurumi, and you can buy them in all sorts of patterns and even like characters you can buy them in. Uh, when you work in the museum industry, a lot of times you end up working on Halloween and a lot of times you're there in a costume. Um, and I found that they're really handy for that because they're warm, they're comfortable, you can slip in and out of them really quick. So I've been buying them every Halloween for the last few years. So this is the one that I bought just last year, Halloween 2019. Uh, the year before that I was a bat, so I have a bat one, and then I was a shark the year before that, so I have a shark one too. Uh, the painting I got in April of 2018. Um, so the last job that I had before I worked at the Headwater Science Center was I worked at the Great Lakes Aquarium in Duluth. Um, and I did a lot of the same type of work there that I do here, where it's a lot of animal handling, taking out education animals to interact with guests, doing uh, demonstrations and talks with animals. Um, and one of the talks that I used to do was their skunk talk. And it just so happened that sort of right as I was training in to start doing their talks was right when the skunk talk was first becoming a thing. They had just gotten the skunks, so they were both little babies when I started. They were only a few months old when I started there. So we kind of trained in together on the demonstrations. Um, and so when I took my job at the Headwater Science Center and left the one at the aquarium on my very last day, I stopped at the gift shop. And I bought this painting, which was done by Snoops, who is the skunk that I generally worked with. They have two of them there, Snacks and Snoops, who are twin brothers. Um, and like I said, they were only a few months old when I was working there, but they'd be full-grown adults by now. So I think today we're going to kind of have two topics that we're going to talk about. First off, we're just going to be having a quick little zoology discussion about skunks, what they are, what they do. Because um, I think they're a really interesting animal that I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. They probably have encountered them in their everyday lives. Um, but I think they're kind of misunderstood and not well-liked creatures. So I think it'd be fun to take a look into them. Um, but the other part of this is, obviously this is something that was made by a skunk. and. How and why would that have happened? So we're going to be talking a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes as far as animal care in places like the Great Lakes Aquarium or the Headwater Science Center where I work now, and how the people there who are responsible for caring for the animals, what they do to ensure that the care of those animals is going above and beyond just making sure that those animals are having their basic survival needs met and making sure that they're actually living lives that are worth living. So just to start, I guess, what are skunks? And skunks are kind of unique. There's not really a whole lot that is really closely related to skunks. And the closest relatives that you would probably know about are what are called the mosteloids. So these are animals like weasels in their family. So it's weasels, it's otters, it's badgers, all those kind of long, skinny carnivores. And that'd be the closest thing that skunks are in with, raccoons too. Um, but if you zoom out a little bit, the larger group that they're a part of is called the caniforms. And so this would be things like dogs, bears. Uh, one unexpected thing that would be in that same group with them, though, is things like seals and sea lions are actually part of that group, too. One of the things that's true about all the animals in the caniforms is that they are all at least partially carnivorous. And this is true for skunks, too. They mostly eat insects. They eat a lot of things like grasshoppers and caterpillars and things like that. But like most animals that eat meat, they also eat some uh, plant matter, too. Skunks eat a lot of fruit, mostly. They're not really built for running and chasing down prey. They're not really hunters. They tend to be more scavengers and insectivores. The type of skunk that you'd find around Bemidji is called the striped skunk, or sometimes you hear it called the common skunk. 
and it's one that you can find throughout pretty much all of the U.S. and Canada. They've got a huge range, that's why they're such an iconic animal in North America. And having such a diverse diet, being able to eat so many different things, is one of the things that lets them live in such a big area. They have long, curved claws on their front legs, which are handy for digging, because they need to dig when they're finding food, but also for digging burrows for themselves. Size-wise, they're pretty similar to, like, a house cat. As far as I know, their fur is always primarily black with a white pattern on it, but the pattern can change pretty dramatically from skunk to skunk, and especially when you start talking about different types of skunks, they can be pretty dramatically different. Some have stripes, some have spots, but the size and thickness and pattern of those can change a lot. They're not very commonly kept as pets by humans, but it's not completely unheard of. I can't speak to this personally, but I've heard they're actually pretty good at keeping mice and rats away, so I know people have had them as like barn animals in the past. They were a very common target for fur trappers in their day. Uh, their fur is considered quite valuable because of the, the black color and how durable it is and how long the hair is. So it was considered exceptionally good fur for making winter coats out of for a long time. And they were also just considered very fashionable, particularly in the UK. The fact that they'll eat pretty much anything you put in front of them also made them a really popular animal to farm for fur, too. They're relative to other animals that are commonly harvested for fur, very easy to take care of. As far as predators in the wild go, they really don't have very many. Uh, there's a very famous passage in uh, Charles Darwin's journal from when he was doing his world travels, where he talks about encountering skunks, and one of the things he talks about is how they walk around almost cockily, they're so sure of themselves that they're not gonna have to worry about any predators. And that of course is because they have a very famous, very well-known defense, the thing that we probably know skunks for more than anything, and that is their smell. And I remember as a kid thinking that skunks just kind of smell bad all the time. That's usually how like they're shown, like you watch like a Pepe Le Pew cartoon, and that's how he is shown, is that he just stinks always, all the time. Um, that's not really how the skunk smell actually works. The way it actually works is that they have these two glands on their rear ends that make sort of this oily, greasy stuff. They make it and they store it back there. And when they are threatened by a potential predator, um, what they'll do is they can spray it. And they can spray it maybe 10 feet, but it's you know, not just something that is a smell that's coming off of them all the time. It only stinks when they spray. And they don't want to spray that much if they can help it because you know once they spray it takes them a little while to reload so to speak so generally what they'll do before they spray is they'll give you plenty of warning and you'll see them do things like puff their tail out and they kind of arch their back and they'll stomp on the ground with their front legs they'll do lots of warning before they spray because like i said they don't want to spray if they don't have to because if they don't have their spray that's one way that they can't defend themselves against the next threat and the spray isn't just smelly it actually uh can be kind of irritating to your skin. I know, I know that eye irritation can be an issue with it. One of the ways it particularly is effective against birds is if you get sprayed a lot with it is that it can actually inhibit their flying a little bit. It can make it hard for them to fly because it's kind of sticky and it can mess with their feathers. That being said, the predators that hunt them the most and the most successfully probably are birds. And a big reason for why birds, particularly owls, are really successful at hunting skunks is that most birds have very limited or no sense of smell whatsoever. So now we know a little bit about skunks, let's get back to that painting. Earlier I called the painting something that was done as an item of animal enrichment at the Great Lakes Aquarium. And what I said enrichment was, was anything that you as an animal caregiver are providing for an animal that's going above and beyond just normal survival requirements, normal living needs. And by that I mean just a basic level of food, water, and providing an environment that is suitable for that animal to be living in. And the basic premise of offering enrichment, the base assumption you're making, is that an animal in the wild is going to see and experience a greater variety of things more often than what an animal living in human care is going to experience. So by providing enrichment, what you're trying to do is replicate the amount of variety that that animal would encounter in the wild. So enrichment can be something as simple as just providing different sensory experiences, a different texture or a different smell or a different taste or a different feel. 
So an example of that that you can see at the Headwater Science Center would be if you go look up in the raptor muse where the hawk and the owl and the falcon live. You'll see one thing up there is that we have a bunch of egg cartons and other things tied to their perches. And that is there for enrichment for the birds because the birds like to experience different textures with their feet. So they'll move from area to area in there and feel different parts of it with their feet. And that's enrichment for them. That's not something that they need to survive, but it's something that is there to mix up their day-to-day, minute-to-minute experience. And the kinds and amount of enrichment that an animal needs uh, largely depends on the type of animal. And so particularly, the amount can vary a lot from species to species depending on the type of animal you're caring for. So for example, we have the cockroaches at the Headwaters Science Center. And really there's not a whole lot that we do on the enrichment end for the cockroaches. Basically we make sure that they have food, we make sure that they have the right temperature inside their tank, we make sure their humidity is good. But beyond that, there's not really a whole lot that we can do for a cockroach to enrich its existence. It's happy as long as its survival needs are being met. And the reason for that is basically that a cockroach doesn't have a developed enough brain to really get bored. And so a lot of enrichment, not all of it, but a lot of enrichment is more or less designed just to stave off boredom for the animals. And so an animal that doesn't have a complex enough brain to really experience boredom doesn't require a whole lot of enrichment from that perspective. And so some other animals that would kind of fall under the same group would be like the amphibians that we have, like frogs and toads and salamanders, uh, the tarantulas, the snakes. These are all animals that on a just providing a new sensory experience for them, we don't really do a whole lot. On the opposite end of that, animals with more developed brains, more intelligent animals, require a lot of enrichment. So the neediest one that we have at the Science Center is probably Angel, the parrot. Parrots are extremely intelligent animals, they're very social animals in the wild. Angel should be getting interaction with other parrots multiple times a day every day if she was in the wild, but she's not. So that means that the humans that are taking care of her need to replicate that. So that means we need to be interacting with her multiple times a day every day. And under normal circumstances, Angel gets a lot of that social interaction that she needs from the guests that come and visit the Science Center. So every guest that comes in and, you know, stops by her cage and talks with her, gives her a scratch on the head is helping us, is participating in Angel's enrichment, but on slower days or times like now where we're in the quarantine and guests aren't coming in, we're having to put in some extra effort on that to make sure that she is being properly taken care of. And some of it's social interaction, but also we do some things with Angel like, you know, introducing new foods to her, taking her out and just letting her explore the science center kind of on her own time. We just, you know, we'll leave her cage open and let her kind of come and go out of her cage as she pleases when we're a little slower. So giving her opportunities to explore the world around her and get social interaction is really important for her in a way that it just isn't for a snake. If you look inside Angel's cage, you'll see that we also provide her with a number of different toys or other knickknacks that she can interact with in there. And that's something you'll see in a few of the habitats that we have at the Headwaters Science Center. It's like the rabbit usually has a toy or two in there. Um, the finches will also have a toy. The raptors upstairs will also generally have some sort of interactive element within their habitat. Particularly for the smarter animals, something Having items that they can input an action to and get some sort of reaction from is also really valuable. So like if you look at Angel's cage, for example, you'll see that she has a handful of little toys or other knickknacks in there, little bells and things like that, where if she grabs them and moves them or bonks her head into them, there'll be a noise that comes out or you know something similar to that. The needs of an individual animal also factor a lot into this. So, before I go forward with this, just disclaimer, this is an animal that I was never a caregiver for, that I never worked directly with in a caregiver sense, so this is just me remembering conversations I had with this animal's caregiver 
two years ago when I worked at Great Lakes Aquarium. So an animal that they have there that is probably their most intelligent animal on their roster is Freeway the Crow. And Freeway is in captivity in part because he has a vision issue. He can't see as well as a crow would need to to survive out in the wild. And so, as I understand it, the normal care practices for keeping crows is that you would make pretty drastic, pretty meaningful changes into their exhibit pretty regularly, like a couple times a year you would go in there and move stuff around quite a bit, um, just to, like I said, keep the exhibit new and fresh and interesting for them to explore. But because of Freeway's vision issue, he struggled with that, so he couldn't see very well, so rather than navigating his exhibit by sight, he relied a lot more on just memory. And so when they moved stuff around in there, he was struggling to navigate within the exhibit. And so rather than doing that and then introducing him to that potential stressful situation or even physically dangerous situation, they just don't really change his exhibit around very much very often. And instead what they do is they put a greater focus on interacting with him with smaller objects, things like toys, that don't really change the landscape inside of his exhibit as much. So if you look at Freeway's exhibit, if you ever go to Great Lakes Aquarium, you'll see there's pretty much always just a bunch of little teeny tiny trinkets toys in there that Freeway can take and collect and stash away in little corners like crows like to do. They like to hide things and collect things. And so they put a particular emphasis on that for Freeway because, like I said, he has a disability that prevents them from doing normal crow enrichment with him. We similarly have Spitfire the Merlin at Headwater Science Center, who is not able to fly. And so if you were to look inside Spitfire's exhibit, you would see that Spitfire has all these little ramps all over her exhibit that'll let her get to different perches around her exhibit. So that's not something we provide for the other birds because they're able to fly enough to get up to the perches that they need to get up to. But because Spitfire has special needs in this regard, we change her exhibit around a little bit, so her exhibit doesn't look like a normal Merlin exhibit would. Another common goal of enrichment is to encourage animals to participate in practices or activities that they normally would in the wild, but don't necessarily need to or get a chance to when they're living with humans. Food presentation is one really common way that you'll see this be done. So on a basic level, if you're providing food for your animal, you can put it in a dish and present it to the animal and they can eat it out of a dish. But you can turn feeding time into an enrichment activity by presenting the food in a way that is a little bit different. And like I said, a lot of the times the goal of presenting it in this way will be to have the animal find food in a similar way to like a wood in the wild. So for something like a skunk, you might bury the food in something so the skunk has to find it and dig it up. Or like we have Rosie the Snapping Turtle at the Headwaters Science Center. And you can buy pellet food for turtles. We could give Rosie pellet food and she would probably be fine. But instead what we do, because in the wild, snapping turtles eat a lot of dead and dying fish, we give her minnows that are injured or dead so that she can find those and eat them. Because that's something that were she living in the wild, she would be doing. So we talked a little bit about skunks, and we talked a little bit about enrichment. So let's go back to our painting. And I mentioned that one of the big main goals of enrichment is to mimic the amount of variation that an animal would experience out in the wild that they don't necessarily experience when they're living in human care. And that would be the main goal of an enrichment item like this painting. So the most obvious thing would be that the paint itself and the canvas would be a feeling, a texture, and a smell that the skunks wouldn't normally experience in their day-to-day -day lives. So it's engaging for them on that end. But I also, I reached out to a friend of mine who still works at the aquarium, and what she was telling me was that when they actually do this enrichment with them, when they actually do the painting, another thing they do is they actually take them to a different room that they don't normally go into, so they have a different space to be in as well, so they get a chance to explore a new, a new area that they wouldn't normally get to go into. And she also mentioned that when they're doing this painting activity, a lot of times they'll get uh, special snacks that they don't normally get as well. Uh, she mentioned mealworms specifically is one that they will often give the skunks when they're doing the, the painting enrichment. So that's going to do it for this episode of Ryan's Room. Thank you all for watching. If you want to see more content like this, make sure you're following us on all of our social medias. Uh, the Headwaters Science Center has a Facebook that's probably our most active one, but we're trying to get our YouTube and our Instagram up off the ground too. Uh, we also have a Twitter. So if you want to make sure that you're seeing all the content we're putting out or just any news that's related to the Headwaters Science Center, make sure you're following us on all those. Thanks guys!